right. So thank you everyone for joining us for tonight's COVID-19 Vaccine Educational Forum for parents and caregivers. We're going to start with interpreter introductions. We'll start with Arabic with Ahmed. Yes, uh, good evening. Masa uh, al-khair, uh, Ahmed Mkhimar, Mutarjim Loha Arabiya. Ahlan bikum fi Sacramento an al-liqa al-ma'limat al-muta'alliqa bi al-walidin. Wa ahlan bikum. Wa zakan andukum aya as'ila biraga idraqta ala al-ballon al-mawgud fi asif al-asfal. Wa narakum ala khair insha'Allah. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll do Mong Lore. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Michael with Mandarin. Sukmento现的今晚的印尼教育论坛，这是针对家长跟看护人们所提供的这个论坛。假如您想使用中文翻译的话呢，我们有提供这个同步翻译。假如使用iPhone或iPad，可以右上角三个点按，去看按按按按
Um, if you'd like to submit a question, you can use the Q&A feature on Zoom to do so. Uh, we should also have some additional time at the end of the program uh, for more questions. Depending on demand and how many questions we get, we may not be able to get to everybody's questions, so we do apologize in advance if that does happen. Also, it's not unusual for us to get some questions that are similar in nature, and so I may paraphrase or summarize questions by theme, but we'll certainly do my best to maintain the spirit of the questions that we do receive tonight. And if at any time this evening you run into some technical glitches and have trouble uh, with Zoom and you need a little help with troubleshooting, you can email Laura Jackson at ljackson at sierrahealth.org for assistance. So just a quick introduction uh, to what we're going to be doing this evening. Uh, you're going to learn the facts about COVID-19, uh, the Delta variant, and how COVID-19 has impacted children in Sacramento. We'll provide you with up-to-date, accurate vaccine information, how it was developed, and why it is safe. We're going to address and dispel some common COVID-19 vaccine myths and misinformation. And our hope is to build trust and confidence in the vaccine and encourage vaccine uptake in children and families. So I'm now gonna introduce both of our speakers for this evening. Our first speaker will be Dr. Makai Owen. Dr. Owen is a pediatrician and assistant clinical professor at UC Davis Medical Center. His clinical interests include preventive care, behavioral health and primary care integration, and population health with a focus on health equity. Dr. Owen serves as clinical lead for Sacramento County Public Health Schools team, providing COVID-19 mitigation education and guidance to schools throughout Sacramento County. Dr. Owen earned his medical degree from UC San Francisco and Master of Public Health from UC Berkeley after earning his Bachelor of Science from Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans. He completed his pediatrics residency at UC Davis and completed a community and societal pediatrics fellowship at the University of Florida College of Medicine. He is board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics. Our second speaker this evening will be Dr. Nicole Macram. Dr. Macram has been a pediatrician and immunization champion for Kaiser Permanente in South Sacramento for nearly 20 years. Dr. Macram graduated from Washington University School of Medicine after completing her undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan. She completed her pediatric residency at St. Louis Children's Hospital in Missouri and is board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics. Prior to working at Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Macron practiced medicine at Southern Illinois Healthcare Foundation. She is passionate about promoting immunizations and overall wellness to Kaiser Permanente members and the community. When not practicing medicine, you can find her cycling or playing the violin with local musical groups and raising her two teenagers with her husband. Dr. Owen is going to start us off tonight Take it off, take, take it away, Dr. Owen. All right, thanks, Nick. So I'm gonna start by talking about uh, some of the basics uh, of COVID-19. And we've all been impacted by COVID-19. And I think we've all spent some time thinking about how the virus spreads. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about the basics because we wanna spend uh, most of our time today talking about uh, vaccine safety and vaccine efficacy. But briefly, COVID-19 is a contagious respiratory illness. Uh, symptoms may appear two to 14 day, days after someone ex is exposed by the virus. And it's, uh, experts believe that it, it mostly spreads from person to person through droplets in the air when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks. As we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, COVID-19 affects different people uh, in different ways and symptoms may range from mild uh, to severe illness. Next slide. So variants are a common occurrence in viruses as viruses have the capacity to change through mutations. And new, and new variants of a virus can occur over time. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there has been a few variants of concerns uh, at different locations around the world. Currently, the Delta variant remains the most dominant coronavirus strain in the United States and the rest of the world. Next slide. So a few important facts about the Delta variant. So it's two to four times more contagious than the original strain. And unvaccinated people are at higher risk of contracting the Delta variant. A Delta variant, excuse me. Uh, the Delta variant can lead to hyperlocal outbreaks. Uh, so we've seen that across the country in areas where there is an, an unimmunized, uh, highly unimmunized population, 
uh, surrounded by a population uh, that is more immunized, immunized, it can lead to rapid transmission uh, in creating a hyperlocal outbreak among unimmunized populations. And we've also seen that children can spread the Delta uh, variant uh, more easily than the original variant that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. And we know that vaccination is the best protection against the Delta variant. Next slide. So now I'm gonna transition and speak broadly about the impact of COVID-19 on children. For most children and adolescents, COVID-19 will be a mild illness. But as we talk about a little bit later, that does not mean that children and adolescents cannot uh, have serious uh, medical complications. And according to the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association, children represent about 16% of all cases of COVID-19 uh, within the United States. And although fewer children have been infected with COVID-19 compared to adults, we know that children can be infected with the virus. We know that they can become sick from the virus and they can have serious medical complications from the virus and children can spread the, the COVID-19, can spread COVID-19 to others. Next slide. Some of the co common symptoms of COVID-19 in children are displayed here on this slide. And what you'll see here is that uh, the, the symptoms in children are generally nonspecific and are often difficult to, to distinguish from other common illnesses, such as cold, flu, uh, headaches, uh, or gastrointestinal illnesses. And the most children that contract COVID-19 will have a mild illness, sometimes with none of these symptoms at all, and sometimes with only a few of these symptoms, some children will have a more significant illness. Next slide. An example of that more serious illness is MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. MISC is a serious condition associated with COVID-19 where different body parts can become inflamed, including the heart, lungs, kidneys, brain, skin, eyes, or gastrointestinal organs. We do not yet know what causes MISC, but we know that many children with MISC had the coronavirus or had been exposed to someone who had the coronavirus. MISC can be serious and even deadly, but most children who are diagnosed with this condition will get better with medical care. Next slide. And children and adolescents with MISC, excuse me, typically experience ongoing fever plus uh, more than one of the following symptoms that are seen on this slide, which usually includes stomach pain, bloodshot eyes, a diarrhea, dizziness or lightheadedness, rash or vomiting. And again, MISC is a rare but potentially serious condition that can impact children who have had or been exposed to COVID-19. And while it's true that most children that contract COVID-19 will have a mild illness, some can have more serious complications uh, like MISC. And we still are, are learning more about potential long-term complications of COVID-19. Uh, many of us have heard about the, ter the term long COVID um, which talks about how people can be impacted long after their initial infection. So there's still more to learn about the long-term impacts of how COVID-19 uh, may impact children. Next slide. So now I'm gonna transition to talk about some national and local data regarding uh, COVID-19. Next slide. And this uh, slide shows COVID uh, cases and deaths in the United States and in Sacramento County as of last week. So the United States, we've had over 741,000 deaths. And here in Sacramento, we've had over 2,300 deaths. In the United States, we've had over 45 million cases. And in Sacramento County, we've had over 156,000 cases. Next slide. This graph shows our local cases and case rate over time. And as we can see here, the COVID-19 pandemic has come in different ways. And currently uh, we are uh, looking to see a, a recent drop in transmission uh, compared to a couple weeks ago. Uh, and we hope that this will be an on, uh, a continuing trend. Next slide. In terms of COVID-19 cases for children and adolescents, 
I want to start with a look at the national numbers. So in total, there have been over 6 million total child uh, COVID-19 cases since the beginning of the pandemic, and 10 states have reported more than 200,000 child cases, and one state uh, uh, reported few, only one state reported fewer than 10,000 cases. Next slide. In terms of the cumulative cases, from the beginning of the pandemic, pandemic until now, children represented about 16.6% .6 of all uh, available cases. And this is likely to be an underestimate because at various points in times during the pandemic, children were recommended to not test as frequently as adults, um, but they still comprise about 16.6% .6 of cases, which again, likely, likely rep represents an underestimate. Next slide. And this graph shows the trends in pediatric cases over time. And what we can see now is that we only have recently um, peaked in terms of pediatric cases of COVID-19. So several weeks ago, um, more children were diagnosed with COVID-19 than at any other time in the pandemic. And currently we're seeing a drop in transmission uh, nationally but we still see relatively elevated levels of COVID-19 transmission among children across the United States. Next slide. And this slide shows trends in hospitalization data over the last 18 months. And due to issues in reporting, the slide looks at only 24 states and New York City. And what the slide shows us is there have been at least 24,500 children and adolescents hospitalized with COVID-19. And the hospitalization rate is about 1%. And this is important to point out though, because as we discussed earlier, most children will have a, a mild illness with COVID-19. There can be rare, um, but serious uh, medical consequences of COVID-19. And we see that with about a 1% hospitalization rate for children and adolescents who contract COVID-19. Next slide. And now we wanna take a look at some of our uh, local numbers. So uh, on our Sacramento County uh, Public Health uh, COVID dashboard, youth cases are broken up into two age groups. So children ages zero to nine and youth 10 to 19 years old. And for children zero to nine, we've had a cumulative total of about 9,400 cases. And for youth 10 to 19, we've had a cumulative total of just over 17,000 cases. Next slide. So uh, this graph looks at school-related cases over the last year uh, with the dark blue representing students. So what we can see towards the right side of the graph is that we are seeing more cases relative in schools and that more of those cases are made up of students as we see the dark blue bar getting bigger. So we are seeing more transmission um, uh, between students and in schools locally than we have previously. And, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. A lot of that is because we have a much higher testing capacity for children here and, and really around the country. And compared to last year, we have many, many more children in school, in-person instruction. Uh, so with that, we expect to see uh, some increase in the cumulative number of cases. Next slide. And this gives another uh, breakdown of cases um, by school grade level as of October. And this goes back to September. So we can see that um, after the initial uh, bar here in September, we had a, a decrease in cases in our local schools. Um, but recently we've had a, a recent uptick in the number of children who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Next slide. And this is another representation of this. So this shows our COVID cases as of uh, uh, October 22nd by age group. And here we can see um, for children age zero to 17, the number of total cases and the number of cases in the last 30 days. And what I wanna draw uh, people's attention to here is the number in red. So the percent change over the last 30 days uh, for youth zero to 17, we've seen a 9% increase where we started to see numbers uh, come down or stabilize um, for older groups. So we see in children, many of which whom are unimmunized, that cases have risen over the last 30 days. Next slide. 
<clears throat> so now we're gonna take a look at who's vaccinated and some of the uh, public health data for vaccine efficacy and success. Next slide. So this is a, a look at the cumulative number of COVID-19 vaccines for children and adolescents under the age of 18 in the United States. So we see here that there's over 13 million children and adolescents who have received at least one dose and over 11 million children and over 11 million adolescents who are fully vaccinated. Next slide. And this map uh, gives a break, breakdown of the proportion of eligible children ages 12 to 17 who have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, by state residents. And we can see here that in California, uh, that number is relatively high compared to other states at 72%. Next slide. And here in Sacramento County, um, with adolescents aged 12 to 17, we have 56% uh, of, of our youth are at least partially vaccinated. So lagging behind the 72% number uh, of California as a whole. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of Sacramento County in general, looking at all populations, we have a, uh, about 57.8% of our population is fully vaccinated. Next slide. So this, this slide looks at kind of some of the success of our local vaccine, and it shows our case rates of vaccinated versus not vaccinated. So the red line here shows case rates over time amongst vac not vac unvaccinated individuals, and the blue line shows the case rate of vaccinated individuals. So we can see um, that the case rate for un unvaccinated individuals continues to be substantially higher uh, than those for unvaccinated. And the red bar here uh, shows vaccinated, uh, the number of cases among vaccinated individuals versus the number of cases among unvaccinated individuals. And this data is kind of, can be somewhat hard to interpret it because it looks at cumulative cases over time. So we wanted to share some data from California Department of Public Health as well. Next slide. So this slide looks at unvaccinated and, and vaccinated data in terms of cases. So here, uh, the red line is cases among unvaccinated and the blue line is cases among vaccinated individuals. And we could see that from October uh, 18th through October 24th, unvaccinated people were 6.8 times more likely to get COVID-19. Uh, next slide. And this looks at hospitalizations. And here we can see that from that, same, from that similar time frame, that unvaccinated people were 9.5 times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 than those who are fully vaccinated. Next slide. <clears throat> and finally, deaths. We see that unvaccinated people were 18.2 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than fully vaccinated people. So from a public health perspective, uh, we're really seeing the positive mm -hmm. impact of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and we'll share some, you know, I didn't want to go, I'm not going to go into some of the safety and efficacy because uh, we're going to do that later in the presentation, but really wanted to share this information to show that, you know, we have really seen uh, broad differences here in California, just like other places around the country in terms of individuals who are vaccinated uh, versus those who are unvaccinated. And with that, we will pause for, for any questions at this time. All right. Um, so Dr. Owen, one question we're uh, receiving is, um, since you work with schools, um, are you familiar with or have any information on some of the mental health challenges that students might be experiencing as a result of COVID and its impacts on schools um, and in-person instruction and everything that goes along with that? Yeah, so I, I think it's a very complex topic um, and it's related to in-person instruction, um, but the impact on children uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic has been very broad. So a lot of children uh, have lost loved ones or have been impacted by loss. A lot of children have had their uh, routines disrupted. 
Uh, a lot of them have been exposed to media that could be very challenging or difficult to them to handle. Uh, a lot of them miss school for a prolonged period of time. So I think it's generally recognized both here in California and, and throughout the country that we really are in the, in the midst of a mental health crisis uh, for our children. And it's really important that we find ways to kind of support them and, and make sure that we have the resources in place to support them as we hopefully come to the conclusion of the COVID-19 pandemic. Great, thank you for that. Um, we had another question in the Q&A. Somebody, um, uh, you talked a little bit about um, the data and um, you know, what percentage of cases uh, are affecting children. Uh, do we have any information on what percentage of children or how many children um, die from COVID? Yeah, so I, I put the hospitalization rate uh, in there to think about kind of what the serious, you know, what percentage of kids are having serious complications such that they have to be hospitalized. And nationally, um, that is somewhere around 1%. The mortality rate from COVID for children is much lower. It's less than 0.1%. Um, um, but again, there's many more factors to think about other than um, mortality. There's MISC, which we talked about, and MISC can have long-term complications, which we don't necessarily uh, know what that may look like in the future. And also, uh, as I discussed briefly, you know, we've heard reports of um, people having long COVID or symptoms much longer after their initial diagnosis. So I think it's important to think about you know, serious consequences and not only the mortality rate, um, but the mortality rate for, for children who have been in, 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 impacted by COVID-19 is less than 0.1%. Thank you, and we'll, uh, we'll do one more. Um, so now that COVID has been around for a little while um, and we know that uh, sometimes people might get COVID and then potentially get it again later on. Uh, are we seeing that in children? Are we seeing repeat infections amongst children? Uh, it's, it's a difficult um, question to answer. It, it can be possible. Um, I think one thing that, that we're learning now is that many children, uh, parents may have suspected um, that they had COVID, but they may not have been tested for a, a number of reasons. And also there's challenges um, with the test as well, so that you know, when children test uh, positive for COVID, they can um, uh, uh, continue to test positive for up to uh, three months. So children generally who get um, COVID-19 will develop some natural antibodies. Um, and the antibodies data suggests that they hold up reasonably well up to three months and it's less likely um, for them to become infected, but it is not uh, impossible. And that's one of the things that kind of uh, we'll need to continue to monitor is, is how people may or may not become infected after an initial infection and what that time course can look like. Great, thank you, Dr. Owen. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Macro. Uh, thanks to Dr. Owen, you set up everything beautifully. Thanks so much. Um, my job today is to talk a lot about the vaccines and the vaccine pretty much singular that we have available for our kids right now, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, both effective and safe. Next slide. This is a quick summary of all the vaccines currently available in the US, but as we know for our kids, unless they're 18 or older, Pfizer is the one that we have available for them. Next slide. So I think there's some concern that the vaccines were developed very, very quickly. So just so you know, uh, the vaccine development process for the COVID vaccines was the same as it was for all the vaccines that your kids get. So they had to go through the same rigorous safety and efficacy testing at, but we were able to do a lot faster by sort of overlapping some of the stages of the vaccines. Um, also good to know is that the CDC is monitoring this vaccine like none other before. So of course, you've, you may have heard about VAERS. 
the, the reporting system for any adverse events, but there are multiple different ways that the CDC and other organizations are tracking safety of this vaccine. Next slide. This is a quick summary of how the Pfizer and Moderna, because Moderna is also an mRNA vaccine work. It's amazing technology. It's not new technology, but it is our first time to get to really put it into play for a vaccine for humans on such a large scale. This is something that's been researched for the last 20 years and luckily perfected in time for this event. The, the vaccine itself is quite a marvel. It is incredibly simple. There's not very much to it. It has a lipid outer layer, which is just like a fatty layer. And that's just to protect the contents inside, which is just this little set of instructions um, called messenger RNA. And these, this messenger RNA works as a blueprint to the body to make the spike protein. Spike protein is what the virus uses to attack our bodies. Our own body makes some of the spike protein and then our own body says, this is not supposed to be here. And it mounts an amazing immune response uh, to the, the spike protein. This centers all of our response on blocking the entrance of this virus into our body, which is why these vaccines are so effective. Um, also, because they are so simple, it is why it is easy to manufacture them and create them uh, quickly. Um, sorry, a lighting difficulty. And uh, uh, also part of the beauty if we need to make some changes in the future. Um, next slide. This is a sort of comparison of the mRNA vaccines to the flu shot, something you may be very familiar with. Our flu shots contain a little bit of killed virus. The flu mist, if you're aware of this, if you have kids that are, are terrified of needles, you may have had a chance to get this for them, actually calls, carries a little bit of a live, what we call attenuated virus. So a virus that cannot cause full blown flu, but is live and is squirted into the nose. The flu shot, as I mentioned, has the killed virus. COVID-19 vaccines have even less. They just have that little set of instructions. There's absolutely no piece of the COVID-19 virus in them. Um, there's no live virus, there's no killed virus, and you cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine. Okay, next slide. This is harking back to the studies that were done on adults. I think this is important to see, um, so you can see just how many um, patients participated. And granted, this was the original strains of uh, the, the COVID vaccine, uh, of COVID, not the Delta, but you can see how many people participated in each of these studies, over 43,000 in Pfizer, over 28,000 in Moderna, over 40,000 in the J&J. &J. Um, very effective overall and incredibly effective for preventing death. Next slide. This is also a slide from the adult data, but I think really important to know that when the studies were done, these were done across races, ethnicities, diverse populations. We had so many wonderful volunteers from all walks of life who wanted to participate in creating the vaccine. So I thought I wanted to just kind of see this breakdown. This again is for the adult. Uh, study. Next slide. Now here's the slide that um, is more relevant specifically to children. Um, we know that in the original Pfizer study, they did include 16 and up. And then with their uh, more recent studies, we have the um, Pfizer study for 12 to 15 year olds. This contained less participants, but still a number, over 2,000. Um, we didn't need as many this time because it had already been studied so ex extensively in adults. Children in the 12 to 15 year age, which includes also the 16 to 18, received exactly the same dose, the 30 microgram dose that the adults get and given 21 days apart. The results showed that the kids had even better immunogenicity, which means just better response to the vaccine. Their bodies worked great to fight off the virus. They had very similar side effects, um, with the most common being soreness on the arm, 
Um, and then often a very transient or brief uh, episodes of fatigue, maybe some headache, chills, and fever. And remarkably, in the vaccinated group, there were no cases of COVID-19. So if you look at the statistics for a study like this, you would say this is 100% effective. We know, of course, based on the smaller numbers, it if we give this vaccine to many, many more, we wouldn't see 100% effectiveness. But the bottom line here is it is incredibly effective for our, for our teens, our adolescents. So uh, basically has a very favor favorable safety profile. It produced fantastic immune response and was highly effective against symptomatic COVID-19. Next slide. This is a summary a little bit about this. And now we know since May, children 12 and older can get this Pfizer BioNTech mRNA vaccine. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, same dose as the adult dose. Um, this is an important point. It is not a weight-based requirement. Instead, it is an age-based. It has to do with the development of the immune system. And um, at our upcoming uh, talk, we're gonna talk about the lower dose that our younger kids will be getting. But um, the 12 and up uh, did fantastic with the adult size dose. And um, another important point, um, initially uh, we, spaced out the vaccine. So if your child had gotten their Tdap booster, uh, we recommended waiting 14 days before they came to get their COVID. Uh, we realize now that's not a requirement, not necessary, and it's very safe for your, your kids to get multiple vaccines at the same time. Their immune systems are fantastic at multitasking. So, next slide. So now we've talked about how effective it is, but you might want to know about the safety. So we did talk about the fact um, that the studies show that the vaccine is safe and effective. Um, and now we have even some additional data for our younger age groups. Um, it's incredibly closely monitored, more closely than any other vaccine in history. The safety studies have shown it, it is safe for our kids and um, kids do get some side effects just like adults. Uh, it's really important for the kids to know that going in. It's important as a parent to know that going in um, that they may have these symptoms lasting typically two or three days at most and then resolving. So we definitely recommend this for anyone 12 and up. Great to talk to us pediatricians if you have questions. Next slide. This is a topic which I think a lot of parents have maybe heard about, and I really wanted to talk about it because there's some scary words here, some scary thoughts, and I want to make sure everyone is well informed. So one of the side effects I haven't spoken about yet, but we do know exists with the vaccine is something called myocarditis or pericarditis. So those are big words. You may never have heard them before. Um, this whole COVID vaccine uh, incident, but myocarditis means an inflammation of the heart tissue and pericarditis means an inflammation of the tissue around the heart. Now that I've explained it, it probably still sounds pretty scary. Here's the good news. Myocarditis and pericarditis are rare, very rare. Um, the most common group to see this following the vaccine is in males, uh, and in the adolescent age range up into the early 20s at the rate of about two or three per 100,000. In girls and females, it's about a tenth of this. Um, the good news about this too is that it's incredibly mild. Um, a lot of times the kids present with some chest pain and then the very next day feel better already. They'll come in, we'll do some tests. We might find some lab abnormalities and then they're given ibuprofen and they feel better. Uh, most commonly, it resolves within a week, and if not sooner, and with no residual or lasting um, effect. This is very different from COVID itself. I think it's important, I don't think everyone realizes this, but COVID 
even apart from that Miss C that Dr. Owens was speaking about, COVID causes myocarditis and much more frequently in the same age range that we were talking about the cases of about two or three per 100,000, that same group will have one out of 45 with a case of COVID can develop a myocarditis. And this myocarditis can be mild, but often is much more severe and much more lasting and lingering. So we know there are some very rare complications of myocarditis, mild, much, much lower risk to get the vaccine than to get COVID-19. Next slide. This uh, is a little plug for the flu vaccine. We would love all our kids in the community to have a chance to get their flu protection as well. So just a reminder, if you're coming in to get your COVID-19 shot, you can get your flu shot at the same time. This is great for parents too. If you had to come in for your COVID-19 booster, go ahead and get your flu shot same time. I will be a case in point. I did exactly that and uh, I, I managed okay. I had a very sore arm, but other than that, I did fine. So next slide. This is a quick review of the um, vaccine itself. So we know that there are three vaccines currently with emergency use authorization in the US. Um, and the Pfizer is actually a full FDA approved vaccine now for 16 and older. And just as of uh, just as of Tuesday, we got our EUA for the kids as well, five to 11. They've all been through rigorous FDA safety processes, rigorous testing, um, three phase uh, trials. They're all highly effective at preventing COVID-19 disease and spread. All three produce antibody responses, and this is important, not just antibodies, but also memory T cells responses and B cell responses. So why this is important is a lot of times you hear about antibody levels, maybe antibody levels are falling. It doesn't mean that the vaccine is not effective anymore. Uh, you still have this wonderful backup of immunity, the T cells and B cells. All right, and oh, also very important is that these vaccines all offer excellent protection against the variants, including the Delta variant. Uh, next slide. Very important with the two dose vaccine to get both doses. Um, a single vaccine of the two dose vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer does not offer enough protection. This was sort of tested in in Great Britain where they started with a single vaccine in everyone first when they had limited supply and really needed the second one to get the full coverage and the full protection. Remember that all vaccines are free in our country. We have amazing access. We're very lucky, very privileged in our country. They're available now for five and up for Pfizer and for 18 and up for Moderna and J&J. Over, way more than a billion, close to 7 billion people in the world have been vaccinated. And we really do hope that the vaccines will bring an end to the pandemic. Thanks. Next slide. Okay, we're going to pause here for um, a few more questions. So, um, Dr. Macram, you talked a little bit about uh, vaccine effectiveness, um, and we've had some questions in the chat about breakthrough cases. So um, you know, it, the gist of it being, if, if vaccines are so effective, how come some people who are vaccinated still get COVID? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, absolutely. Uh, and, and this kind of goes a little bit along with the question for Dr. Owen earlier about breakthrough cases after you've had COVID. This happens as well. So. Um, why does it still happen? Uh, everybody's immune system is a little bit different. We know we were never going to be able to create a vaccine that was 100%, even though in that study for our adolescents, it looked like it was 100%. Um, that was because of the numbers involved. Uh, these vaccines are, are much higher efficacy than a lot of the vaccines that we give our kids currently. Um, and it really pay, plays the most important role, which is to prevent incredibly effectively against severe disease. Now, what we think is happening when we see more of the um, outbreak, you know, breakthrough cases, 
um, and people who have been vaccinated, a lot of times what's happened is their antibodies may have waned a little bit. Um, so I talked about the fact that the immune system uses multiple different techniques for uh, keeping us healthy and repelling the COVID vaccine. The antibodies are often that first fast um, response. And when the levels are high, they can immediately sort of go to work in the nose where that virus sort of attacks us and knock it out. When the antibody levels start to wane a bit, the virus can make its way in. But the reason we see almost always very mild disease in people who have had their vaccine is because we have this backup T cell, B cell um, attack. So this attack um, doesn't keep the virus from getting in completely, but does keep it from causing any sort of serious disease. So that's what we're really seeing. So when there are breakthrough cases, they tend to be very mild. Great, thank you. Um, another interesting question that, um, that came up here is, you talked a little bit about how different vaccines are, are created, the flu vaccine, flu mist, COVID vaccine. Why, uh, why did they choose the process that they chose for, for COVID? And why didn't they make it the same way they make the flu vaccine, for example? Great. Um, so they did, but just not the ones that came. So I didn't put a slide in about all the different types of vaccines that are on the like market or available around the world and are still awaiting approval. Um, the reason we got Pfizer and, and Moderna first is because they are mRNA vaccines. And as I mentioned, they're incredibly simple. And it's a very quick technology. Once we figured out spike protein is what we need to attack, it was very simple to create that set of that blueprint, that little set of instructions. And the technology existed already. Put that set of instructions inside just this little lipid layer, boom, and it was ready. So it's such a mobile kind of um, flexible way of producing vaccines. Uh, there are options. There's one called Novavax, which I think just got its EUA in some other countries. And I was thinking about applying for its um, EUA here in our country. Turns out to be an effective vaccine as a much more traditional, um, uh, much more like the flu vaccine, also effective, but it took them a lot longer to get everything going because it wasn't an mRNA vaccine. So that's why those vaccines sort of predominate at the moment. Great, thank you. And uh, let's do one more. Um, so I know there are different kind of levels of approval for vaccine. So we've had some questions about emergency use, use authorization and what exactly that means. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So in each of these cases, we've had big numbers in the studies, things, uh, testing was done in wide populations covering lots of different ethnicities and races, but there was some overlapping that sped up the process. Um, the EUA, the emergency use authorization is a first stage that can happen more quickly, even though the FDA and the CDC have a lot of data, they do not have as much data over time as they would normally have had. This is where the EUA comes in. Um, so as you see, the Pfizer vaccine over a, a longer stretch of time was able to get the full FDA approval. Um, and that was really about the only additional thing that was added was just they were able to look over a longer period of time. Um, that, that is their traditional way of approving a vaccine. So the EUA had all the same safety steps, everything the same, except that we didn't have the, the sort of time data. But at the time, we didn't have time for the time data. So this is why it was an emergency use authorization. I hope that explained it. All right, thank you. So we'll continue on with your slides now. I think we started to cover a little bit of common concerns, but I know there are many things that are weighing heavy on parents' minds. Um, this has been such a difficult time for our kids and our families, and you hear so much information, it is hard to sort through it. So my job now is to try to help you sort through it, help hopefully get you some, some information that can help you make your decisions. So next slide. 
here I just threw out a few of the most common concerns that we hear from our parents and that have been on the news and are often in social media. We covered the first one, I think, a lot, but we'll talk a little bit more about this, that the, the vaccines were just not tested enough, they were created too quickly, they might not be safe. Um, a lot of people are worried about potential side effects. Um, we talked about those a little bit. Uh, I think we can talk about that some more. Um, some people are afraid of getting COVID from the vaccine. Some people have heard things about infertility, difficulty during pregnancy or breastfeeding with the vaccine, just maybe some questions about how it could affect puberty. So there's a lot of things around uh, that that have been in the news and on social media. And then some worry, are very worried about there being harmful ingredients in the vaccine. So let's kind of get a little bit deeper into each of these. Next slide, please. So concern number one, vaccines created too quickly to be safe. Um, we've talked a lot about this so far. So we know that the vaccines were made quickly, but we also know why and how. So one, the mRNA vaccines in particular are nimble, easy to manufacture, very little parts to them. It's like making a car with three parts. And so they can be assembled quickly. The test, the level of testing, the phase three trials, so going through one and two, looking at all safety concerns, and then the third one looking at both safety and efficacy are um, exactly the same. And the same number of patients were required to be in these as in other vaccine trials, and they were overlapped. And there was also tremendous interest globally. So not only was there like a lot of money poured into this process, there were lots of volunteers. So many people were eager, eager to help um, and put an end to the pandemic. So lots of people volunteering very quickly, many people working on this all at once, all across the world. Um, I had a chance to be a part of one of the teams working on the Pfizer vaccine. We we're just one small team, and this was a global operation to get enough people enrolled in, in the vaccine trials. Next, next slide. The next slide is just a nice analogy. So if you've ever watched one of those makeover TV shows where they're able to do an entire remodel in like a week, you can see that they have unlimited resources in most cases. They have huge teams that are sort of working on each individual aspect of the remodel, not the way you or I might be able to pay or hire someone to remodel even our bathroom. Um, and that's, that's how they could get this done so quickly. Next slide. Worried about potential side effects. Um, yes, there are some side effects. I think a lot of people who, uh, parents, if you've had your vaccines, you're, you're well aware of, of these, almost always there will be um, some soreness in the arm. Um, that's actually the most common side effect. It is um, it, typically after both. You might have some redness or swelling, almost certainly some pain. Um, it tends to be a little bit more after the second one. Um, throughout the rest of the body, the real common side effects are just sometimes some fatigue, some headache, some muscle aches, some chills, some fever. Some people have a little bit of upset stomach. You may have also heard about the fact that lymph nodes on that side where you got your shot can sometimes swell. Um, these are typically very short-lived, typically about 12 to at most 72 hours. And it's a sign that your body's building protection. I think as parents, we need to let our kids know about this so they're not so scared if it happens. Uh, and really I should say when it happens, because it will likely happen. They have amazing immune systems, so they're gonna have some of their immune um, side effects. Next slide. Okay, these are some steps that you can take to help boost the immune system, but also just decrease the side effects. Um, make sure your teens get good sleep the night before they get their vaccine. Actually, I advocate for this always as a pediatrician, but in particular, um, it'll just help their body be prepared and respond well to the vaccine. Make sure they eat before they go. Um, they might feel a little nervous or it might be their routine to not eat breakfast. Of course, that's another topic that we'd love to talk to as pediatricians, but um, eat some health, a healthy meal with whole foods, uh, hydrate well, 
uh, drink lots of fluids. Um, I'm not sure how many parents have teens that have had this happen, but there's, an, there's a thing called vasovagal syncope. Um, this means uh, when you stand up quickly, or if you're in church and you're standing with your legs locked, um, you can faint. Um, this happens to, to potentially anyone at any age, but teenagers are particularly um, vulnerable to this. So it's extra important for them to eat their meal and hydrate well. This is not even a side effect of the medication. It's not an allergy or anything like this. It's just something about being a teenager and when they get nervous and worried about things, they can get clamped down and not get enough blood flow to their brain. So their brain says, ah, gotta, gotta faint to help get gravity on the side. So make sure they're drinking well. Um, stay informed. So we talked about how important it is to inform your teen about the usual side effects. And it's fine to take some medicines. So if they are on any usual medications, they should take that. Um, it is fine to treat any side effects with either Tylenol or ibuprofen. Next slide. Afraid of getting COVID-19 from the vaccine. None of the COVID-19 vaccines contain the live virus, the killed virus, or any actual piece of real virus. So you cannot get COVID-19 from the Pfizer vaccine. Um, instead, the vaccine helps you from ever getting COVID-19 and it teaches your body how to fight it off. Next slide. So vaccine effects on fertility. Um, this was a message that was just spread like wildfire on social media. I can tell you where it started. There was a doctor and an employee of Pfizer who had some anti-vaccine sentiments. And they put out a claim that the body, uh, when it got the vaccine, made antibodies that could attack the um, placenta. So there's several things. First, the antibodies do not attack the placenta. Um, also, uh, if you have a placenta, you're already fertile. So it is not an effect on fertility. And finally, in the big adult trials, they excluded pregnant women, but some women got pregnant. And it was about equal on both the side who got their vaccine and the one who, ones who got uh, placebo. Also, rates of fertility are the same for women who are vaccinated and those who are not. And I just also want to talk to any parents who might be pregnant. Um, it is highly encouraged for you to get a vaccine. There have been absolutely no complications um, from the vaccine to pregnant moms, but pregnant moms can get really, really sick from COVID-19, much sicker than, than other women the same age, and it can cause problems for their fetuses and babies. Next slide. Effects on breastfeeding. You may have also heard that, that you couldn't um, breastfeed and get your vaccine. This is actually not the case. Another uh, important uh, point um, the vaccine protects the mom, which helps protect the family. And also mom uh, doesn't pass vaccine through the breast milk, but the antibodies that help to protect her get passed through the milk and can help to protect the infant. So very safe for uh, nursing moms to get their vaccine. Next slide. Ah, harmful ingredients in the uh, vaccine. So we already spoke about the fact there's no live virus or any parts of the virus in the vaccine. The ingredient list for the vaccine does not have any toxic ingredients. There's no latex, there's no iodine, there are no metals. I think sometimes you may have read that, um, iron, cobalt, uh, lithium, any of the uh, rare earth alloys. And there are no preservatives in the vaccine, such as thimerosal that contains mercury. None of those are in this vaccine. You may have heard that there might be microchips or magnets in the vaccine. That is not the case. I put up the list of what is actually in the vaccine. There's the mRNA, the set of blueprints to instruct the body. There's that fatty layer to help that mRNA and protect the mRNA so it can get into the muscle. And then there's a little bit of a salt and sugar uh, solution, like, like a salt water to stabilize the mRNA inside that. And that's it. Next slide. So 
So maybe the crux of why people are on the call tonight is why should my child be vaccinated? Next slide. I think, uh, I think that Dr. Owen set this up very well by letting you know that while, thank goodness, kids do so well with COVID, um, kids do get sick with COVID. So th the bottom line here is the most important reason for you to get your kids vaccinated is to protect your child. We know lots of cases are mild, but even in those mild cases, kids can go on to develop a month later, Miss C, that Dr. Owen talked about earlier. The Delta variant changed everything for our kids, whereas early on in the course, they, they were not big spreaders. They rarely got uh, COVID except from parents right in the household. That is no longer the case. And they actually make up a higher percentage of people getting COVID relative their percentage in the country. Yes, it can help protect our community or even just your family. And I'll talk briefly at the end about some how it can provide better immunity than natural illness. Next slide. We talked about COVID-19 being more deadly than the flu and other illnesses that we already give our kids vaccines to protect against. It helps to keep our kids healthy. So we mentioned a little bit about, and, it, and it's hard to hear about deaths. We know that those are very rare for kids, but there's so many consequences of COVID for kids. There's all that missed school. There's missed time with friends. There's just potential for long COVID, other things like that. So vac vaccinated kids are obviously much less likely to have all of those serious side effects, but all of, all of the effects that COVID has sort of wreaked on our adolescents. Um, you can see that, again, I was just mentioning that we've had this spike in the cases that began in July with the Delta variant. And for our kids really has, has not gone away yet because they ha haven't really had that chance to get vaccinated. Next slide. So we talked about how the Delta variant really changed things. Vaccination helps prevent the spread because there are fewer infections and also likely less viral load in the nose to spread. And when people do have breakthrough cases, they last a shorter amount of time. Um, also, I just wanted to point out that we're all hopeful that COVID is on the decrease and um, maybe that could mean the end of things, but generally what's assumed is we might move from what's called a pandemic state to an endemic state, much like the flu is currently in our world. And we don't think this is a virus that's going away anytime soon. Uh, coronaviruses also tend to get worse during the winter time. So we see other coronaviruses tend to increase. We, hopefully this might not happen with ours, but we definitely have to be on the lookout and wary and is another reason to protect our kids. Next slide. So as I referenced, there's the study done by the CDC because I think we all had a lot of question. We know for other illnesses, if you get the illness, you can develop a lifelong immunity. Well, couldn't this be the same for COVID that a natural infection should offer lasting protection? As Dr. Owen had mentioned earlier, we do see it offers pretty good protection for that first three months, but there are definitely breakthrough cases. I've had kids that have been infected multiple times. So the CDC looked at this big study of 7,000 people who are hospitalized. And the people who are hospitalized, they compared who had previously had COVID, so should have immunity from that, versus the people who had been vaccinated. And they found that those with previous COVID were about five times more likely to be in the hospital. This is a pretty good test showing that in the immunization was more effective previously having COVID. Um, there also was this pretty cool study that showed if you'd had COVID and then got your vaccine, you could develop some super immunity. Okay, next slide. Five key po summary points. We'll, we'll go through quickly and then open it up for questions. The vaccine is safer than COVID. Evidence is overwhelming. The vaccine can protect you from dying. It can protect you from getting very sick. It can protect you from ending up in the hospital. And the majority of people in the hospital 
the vast majority are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. Side effects from the vaccine are common, but mild and temporary. Um, next slide. The risk of getting COVID-19 is greater in 2021 than it was in 2020 because of the mutation of the strain to the Delta variant, at least four times as likely to spread. Um, plus, of course, we've opened things up quite a bit, also allowing for more viral spread in general. Um, so pretty much your choices become you can get vaccinated or you can get COVID. Um, and, and as I mentioned, realize that COVID-19 is unlikely to go away. Um, just like we still have flu after the massive flu pandemic of 1918, we have what's called endemic illness. That's what we anticipate will happen for COVID-19. And then next slide. Vaccines offer hope. They really do. They have a hope for ending at least the pandemic portion of this, this COVID. Um, they help prevent transmission. We need to have lots of people vaccinated to help achieve this community immunity, but we also want your child to get protected because it's the right thing to do for your child and it's the best way to keep them healthy. It keeps them in school, it keeps them learning. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Macrum. So um, we've had uh, quite a bit of uh, questions submitted in the uh, Q&A, and, &A, and um, I'm actually going to maybe have you just talk about something you just talked about recently, only because we had quite a few questions about natural immunity in the, um, in the Q&A. So maybe you could just talk a little bit more about that and what, how that compares to the vaccine and, and what, that, what that all means. Exactly. So I will uh, preface this with the fact that this is an ongoing study for us in medicine. So we don't have all of the answers about this comparison. We just have several good studies that have been done now to look at this. And we also have thoughts about why one might be better than the other. So absolutely, we know that natural getting COVID-19 does result in some immunity. The immunity wanes and we know people get reinfected. It seems like it wanes at different rates for everybody. Some, somewhat similar to the vaccine as well. Um, with the vaccine, we're able to monitor very closely uh, in all of our study participants, how that immunity might be uh, waning. It's a more difficult task uh, to do. It's a messier task to do with the uh, um, people who have had uh, COVID itself. Um, we presume I mentioned uh, that CDC study, it's probably one of the best studies to show how people who end up in the hospital are much more likely, who have either had COVID or had the vaccine are much more likely to have had COVID before, demonstrating that having had the disease is not offering as good of protection as the vaccine. This still seems and feels, I think, to some people counterintuitive, having had the, the the, the actual illness with all parts of that virus, shouldn't that have stimulated the best sort of immunity um, compared to a vaccine? And it seems that the way the mRNA and the other vaccines that really focus on the spike protein trains our body in the best sort of way to keep the virus from invading us at all. It's not distracted by all the other parts of the virus, which are actually not important for fighting off the virus. It has trained our body specifically towards that way that the, the virus enters our body. And thus, I think that's why you get the very excellent immune response. I hope that was what you wanted to hear. Yeah, thank you for that, yes. Um, so I, I think at this time, yeah, perfect. I'll, I was going to invite Dr. Owen to, to come back on as well. So um, I've kind of, we've been kind of tracking some of the questions that have come up in the Q&A. So, um, I'll go through those and, and, and kind of throw them out there for either one of you, both of you, whoever, um, you know, would like to address them. Um, so uh, one question that came up um, is obviously for kids, we're talking a lot about the Pfizer vaccine. And so the question was, well, you know, adults have three vaccines to choose from. How come kids right now only really have one? 
Okay. Um, right now, uh, only Pfizer has completed their studies for this age group. Now, Moderna also has been working on it. They had a lot more adjusting of their doses. I'm not sure if the audience is aware, but the Moderna vaccine in the adult form is an even bigger dose than what's in the Pfizer. They're very, very similar. Um, and they had to work more on adjusting their dose to find what would be safe and, and effective for kids. So I think that may have been a little bit of a delay on their end. Um, the J&J &J has not even done any studies at this point in younger ages. And um, the other vaccines are still waiting to get their adult approval, like the Novavax that I mentioned. So that's a very promising vaccine and would be great um, for people who have some reservations for on, on what they are thinking maybe as a newer technology. That's, that's the one that I mentioned is based on the older technology. Um, not sure if you have anything to add to that, Dr. Owen. No, nothing to add. <clears throat> All right, thank you for that. Um, so I know we, we talked a little bit about the, um, the studies that have been done. Um, I know a lot of folks have, have expressed concerns about the potential for long-term side effects. Um, you talked a little bit about the immediate impacts, you know, the day of, the day after, but some folks are worried about longer term. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, on the one hand, our kids are lucky this vaccine was approved first for adults. It's exactly the same vaccine. So we have now about a year worth of um, information about possible long-term side effects. Um, so there's that piece of news for our kids. Um, also looking back in time at all the vaccines that we've ever given to our kids and to adults, uh, long-term side effects out past the first four months following getting the vaccine are in incredibly rare and almost unheard of. Um, so we have just that sort of history to go on. Thank you. Um, do we have data or do we know how effectiveness is actually studied? Are kids exposed to COVID um, after they're vaccinated or how, how, are, how are we determining how effectiveness? Do we know? So uh, that's a great question. So the way that they're determining that when you hear effectiveness for the vaccine, what they do is you know, they divide the um, subjects in the study into two groups and they are monitoring for symptoms. So what, and then if somebody has symptoms, they'll be COVID tested. They also started doing just testing um, in, in the populations, because we do know sometimes COVID can be incredibly mild and asymptomatic to try to catch the asymptomatic cases as well. The original studies with the adults though did not do that initially. They were looking for symptomatic, so they would test when, when people had symptoms, which is really the most important thing our vaccine needs to do. It needs to prevent people from getting sick. So what they then do is they compare how many people in each group got COVID. And that's how they determine the effectiveness. So the, as I mentioned, the adolescent effectiveness number was 100% because nobody got COVID in the uh, COVID, um, the people who got the shot. The number of people who got COVID in the placebo was also relatively small. It's not a huge number of um, patients. I think it was in the 16 to 20 perhaps range, but that's still 100% effectiveness when you have nobody in the placebo group getting the shot. So these kids are not exposed directly to COVID. Um, they're just living their lives and getting COVID because there's a pandemic and there's a lot of COVID around. So some of the studies are, are um, done. If, it's easier to do in a country like ours where we have a lot more COVID than if we went to New Zealand, we cannot even really do the study because there's no COVID circulating there. Um, so our country with its rather large surges has been unfortunately a great place to study vaccines. So I hope that clarifies. So uh, another question kind of in that same vein is how long have the studies been going on? 
right? Well, we know that we got approval for the adults. I mean, this they started about how many months before? I guess about it took them around four months, I think, before that study came through. And we know they were already um, studying. So we were starting in the summer of 2020. We were, I remember, I, I have to go back in time. I think time itself has sort of, sort of changed for us during the pandemic. But in the spring, um, we were already working on setting up the designs um, and getting all the certification and doing all the patient consent forms and all of that sort of thing. So all the way back to that time was a start for the adult studies. Um, I can't remember the exact date that we started putting the shots in arms for the study, but it's been since last summer. So it's been a long time. So Dr. Owen, this one uh, might be for you, but also I think Dr. Macram, you mentioned in your bio that you've got a couple of teenagers, so you can probably both speak to this. Um, just in terms of, you know, what are the, the benefits in terms of school and activities of being vaccinated for, um, for adolescents? Yeah, so I think the, the benefits of being vaccinated are, are really substantial. So you know, if, if you are unvaccinated and you have an exposure, you're very likely uh, that it's going to be, it's recommended that you uh, quarantine for at least five days, um, possibly longer. And like, like Dr. Macron was saying, you know, we don't expect uh, COVID to go to zero uh, within the next school year. So as we think about, you know, the rest of this school year and the next school year, it's likely that we'll see uh, children who are not vaccinated have ongoing exposures and potentially have to be repeatedly um, quarantined uh, and miss school. It also is much more likely uh, if you're vaccinated that you'll be able to participate in uh, extracurricular activities and, and sports and, uh, and will not be excluded um, if you have uh, an exposure to COVID-19. But I think collectively, if we really think about if we have, you know, most the majority of our kids uh, get vaccinated, we have a high vaccination rate then I think we can get back to normal um, much quicker and we can start to pull back some of these restrictions as we see our levels decrease uh, in our community and kind of protect those who are unable to get the vaccine right now be because of their age. So I think the, the more kids that get vaccinated, uh, the, more, the less transmission we'll see and we'll be able to pull, pull back on more and more of the restrictions and, and let the kids get back to normal. Thank you for that. Um, we had a, a question uh, specifically about individuals who have autoimmune deficiencies and whether or not they should be vaccinated. Um, I could talk a little bit about that. Um, yes, they absolutely should be because they're at much higher risk for getting severe COVID when they have um, immune deficiencies. Uh, we see that definitely in the adult population and the same carries through for kids. We actually have some special protocols for treatment if we think um, a child with immune deficiencies for whatever reasons has gotten exposed. There are, there are treatment protocols for those kids. They need extra treatment. Getting vaccinated is important and some are even eligible for the third dose because with an immune deficiency, we realized two doses was not enough to boost the immunity to the same level as somebody without an immune deficiency. So safe and the right thing to do and the best way to protect a, a child with an immune deficiency. So uh, another question that came up about uh, myocarditis and pericarditis, um, in terms of those side effects, do we know if those typically occur after the first dose or the second dose? This is a great question. It's most typically after the second. And while we recommend the 21 day spacing between vaccines, because it does get that full protection in place the quickest, we're starting some studies to look if pushing that out a couple weeks might decrease that risk of myocarditis. We don't have the data yet, but it's an option for parents who are particularly worried about that side effect to wait four or five 
or even up to six weeks after the first dose, but realize that entire time your child isn't fully protected. So it is most commonly after the second dose. So uh, this question asks you to maybe pull out your crystal ball. Um, so, you know, obviously we've, we've kind of seen the evolution of a vaccine, you know, and, and now the talk of third doses and booster doses. Um, any sense for, or of, you know, how frequently folks will need to get a booster shot? Um, what, you know, what the future looks like in terms of, of boosters, different vaccines and things like that? It's tricky when there are two of us because I'm not sure which of us is going to handle it, but I'll jump in. I don't mean to butt in. And, and Dr. Owen, please fill in if you want to. This is a crystal ball question for sure, but um, we don't think that we're going to get into the same sort of cycle that we see with the flu. So I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but the flu virus is a way higher mutating kind of virus than uh, the COVID virus. So we have, I think as a community, um, has learned a lot about mutations and variants and things that you may not have been aware of. But the reason we get our flu vaccine every year is because the flu mutates even when it's not spreading through um, billions of people the way um, COVID has, it mutates very quickly. So that's why we sort of fall into the having to get a flu vaccine every year to protect us every year it gets changed. So we get to improve our immunity for the strains that are circulating. COVID is actually a much slower mutating uh, virus and our vaccine so far does a fantastic job protecting us against even the variants that have developed. Um, slightly less with the Delta, but still excellent in the 80 to 90% range. So. Um, we're hopeful that with this lasting T cell and B cell memory and without new unusual ways that the virus finds of entering our body, and as we get the numbers down in the community, our existing vaccines uh, will, will last and give us enough protection and immunity to prevent serious disease and death and overwhelming the health system without having a, a cycle of boosters. But that was the crystal ball that I had. It's a hopeful one. Okay, I think we might have time for a couple more quick ones. So uh, hopefully this one's quick. Did the vaccine cause the Delta variant to be created? Yeah, I think we talk, I talked a little bit about that, but you know, it's common for viruses to, to mutate and change over time. And I think with, with viruses, kind of we expect them to mutate and new variants to pop up. So, um, and the Delta variant kind of really became the dominant strain even before vaccines were really um, at the level they were now. So, you know, there's no evidence that the, the, the vaccine caused the Delta variant in any way. And then I think our, our last one, we uh, had a, folk, a couple of folks express in the Q&A you know, maybe they're on the fence as parents, they're not sure, um, you know, what, what would your advice be to those that are, are wanting to maybe wait to see more data or to kind of see how things go um, versus getting vaccinated now? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll take this since I do have two teens and um, maybe talk a little bit about it and Dr. Owen can as well. Um, it's understandable you're a good parent because you're trying to do your best to do the right thing for your child. Just like we as pediatricians are trying to give you the best information we can so you can make a good decision. Um, I had both of my kids vaccinated pretty much as quickly as they had a chance. So I have a 17 at the time she got vaccinated 16 year old um, girl. And then when he got his chance, my 14 year old son got his vaccine. And I just want you to know, I would never recommend something to you without having my own kids have the same. So the things that I'm telling you are things that I used to make my decision. I think the vaccine is safe. It's effective. It's the best way to keep your kids healthy. I know that right now is a scary time and it's a hard time to make decisions. I think 
the vaccine is the best decision you can make to protect your kids. So I would add that now we have seen, you know, over 10 million children have received the vaccine. Um, and I think, you know, that's enough data now to show us that the vaccine is both protecting them, uh, but it's not harmful to them as well. And I think another thing uh, that can be very challenging to think about is, is 1% seems like such a small number uh, when you think about the serious co potential consequences of COVID. So if we think about that there's only a 1% chance uh, that a child will be hospitalized with COVID, that 1% looks a lot different uh, when it's your child or when it's a, a child that you know or it's your, your child's friend or, or a loved one. And I think the, the vaccine is, is safe enough for me with, with my children that that 1% even is not a risk that I'm willing to take. And we know with MISC what, that while it is rare, it can, be de it can have devastating consequences. And, and as a pediatrician, you know, I don't uh, mean to, to put uh, undue fear um, in, in people's minds or in people's hearts. But if you think about a typical elementary school or if you think about a typ typical high school that could have, you know, a, a thousand students, you know, 1% is, 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 is a fair amount of kids that could potentially have uh, very significant impacts of COVID that cause them to be hospitalized. And again, that's not even uh, counting uh, the side effects of things like potential uh, long COVID and also, you know, the social consequences. So uh, as, as more people are unvaccinated, um, it's more likely that we'll have transmission. It's more likely that we will continue to have um, restrictions in place um, for our children. So I think for me, as a parent myself, uh, you know, I feel comfortable that, you know, the vaccine is safe. It's not a risk that I'm willing to take, um, even if it's 1%. And I also think that collectively, as more children and adolescents uh, get vaccinated, we'll be able to get um, our schools and our environments back to the routine uh, that our kids and, and our adolescents are used to, um, uh, to get them the support that they need, uh, especially in the midst of the mental health crisis that we talked about a little bit earlier. All right, so thank you both for that. Um, I just want to quickly point out um, some additional resources for information, uh, more information on vaccination, uh, where you can find vaccine clinics near you. Uh, MyTurn.ca.gov was actually just updated today. Um, it also now reflects eligibility for five to 11 year olds, uh, which I know was not the focus of tonight, but that segues into the fact that we are planning another one of these sessions uh, in a couple of weeks on November 16th, where we will focus more on that age group, the five to 11 year olds. Um, and so however you heard about tonight's session, uh, we will be spreading the word through those same channels. So look forward to an invite soon for that. Um, so again, this was a, a, a presentation uh, in cooperation with uh, Kaiser Permanente, the Center at Sierra Health Foundation in Sacramento County Public Health. I would like to thank everyone for participating tonight for submitting your questions. Um, as a reminder, this was recorded and we will be posting it online and sharing it widely uh, through the same channels uh, where the invitations were sent out. So you can revisit it. Um, again, myturn.ca.gov uh, for information on vaccine clinics near you. A special thank you to our, all of our interpreters, Ahmed, Lore, Michael, Alexander, Frida, Anna, and Tyler. And of course, to our two presenters tonight, Dr. Owen and Dr. Makram. Good night, everyone.